Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for In Perspective, Old Testament God versus New Testament God here at Denver Seminary. We're truly grateful for you joining us today. And uh, I'm just going to explain a few things how the time together is going to work, look like, and uh, um, and then kind of make some introductions and we'll kick it off. So I'm going to first explain how Q&A will work today. We'll answer audience questions throughout the webinar. Please submit through Q&A. We do not have the raise your hand feature as this is a uh, webinar, so we will not be able to see you. Um, and also, we also ask, encourage people, if you like one of the questions that have been submitted, you can upvote them as well. We'll try to get to a lot of the questions, but I promise you we will not be able to answer them all during our time together as we do have uh, 350 people signed up for this webinar, which is really exciting and shows the desire and hunger for a deep understanding of who God is. So, um, so a couple of things we're going to highlight before we get going. One thing is if you're interested in learning more about Denver Seminary and our program is we want to offer you and we want to invite you to attend a preview day on Thursday, March 16th. You will have a chance to meet our admissions and financial aid teams, sit on a class, hear from our panel of current students, and eat lunch with some of our faculty. We also offer our $250 travel voucher. So please contact the email is at email is connect at denverseminary.edu to learn more. And if you're not interested in being a student, then please consider supporting our students who are pursuing various degrees at Denver Seminary. Hunger for a deeper understanding of who God is. When you give to Denver Seminary, your gifts make an external, an eternal impact. Your generosity also engages the needs of the world with the redemptive power of the gospel and the life-changing truth of scripture, which is, which is actually our mission statement here. So please visit denverseminary.edu slash give to give now or reach out to anybody in the advancement team. And by the way, my name is Chris Johnson, the vice president of advancement. And our role at advancement is really donor relations, alumni relations, and church partnerships. So you can find us on the website easily. We'd love to connect with you, even take you out for a coffee at some point. Okay, so um, please submit those questions throughout it. We're gonna probably start off with a good 20 or 30 minute mark asking our panelists some questions, and then you'll see me jump up and ask some, jump on, ask some questions throughout this webinar, but we really want to use your time effectively. We're excited to have this great conversation. So I'm going to invite our wonderful president, Dr. Mark Young, to join, turn on his sound and screen to join us and introduce our panelists today. Glad to do it. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Yeah, my name is uh, Mark Young, and I'm the president here at the seminary. If we haven't had a chance to meet. I would love to meet you. Been here now 13 and a half years, uh, 13 and a half challenging and, and very satisfying years, I would say. Uh, first, let me clarify that Denver Seminary doesn't believe there are two gods, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. Uh, we we affirm monothe Trinitarian monotheism and have, since our founding, there's one God. And our task today, our joy today, is to understand better how God reveals himself in both the Old and the New Testaments. So in order to help us do that, we have a couple of guests I want to be, I want to introduce to you. I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Darlene Seal and Dr. Jim Greenberg to join us, if you would. Go ahead and turn your cameras on and your sound on. i am introduced Dr. Seal to you. She is, an ad she is Assistant Professor of New Testament at Denver Seminary. She holds a PhD in Christian Theology and Biblical Studies uh, slash New Testament from McMaster Divinity College. I believe that's in Toronto, right, Darlene? Hamilton, Ontario, but in an Hamilton, hour Ontario. Oh, I probably just offended several people. And I <laughs> believe she studied with the uh, Denver Seminary graduate Cindy Westfall up there. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Well, at least I got one thing right. <laughs> <laughs> she holds our master's degree, as I said, as well as a bachelor's degree from Wachita Baptist. Uh, you served as a lecturer at McMaster, and you've taught here as well as an adjunct before joining our faculty full time. Let me just ask you, what was your dissertation topic? Well, if you want my elevator pitch on my dissertation topic, um, assuming you don't want the whole spiel, uh, <laughs> but uh, basically I, I did kind of an interdisciplinary work bringing in uh, social identity theory from social psychology um, and then kind of creating a method uh, by which to read social relationships in the Greek text. Wow. Uh, and in doing that, I, I looked especially at uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, both places where Paul is very much bringing in 
Exodus and wilderness narratives from the Hebrew scriptures and um, working his Gentile readers into them in a way that helps them reframe certain issues they're facing, like whether or not they can eat idol food uh, and these sorts of things. And so that's kind of the gist of uh, looking at how Paul is actually uh, working with the Hebrew scriptures at a social level of interaction with his Corinthian addressees uh, and hoping to shape their identity as communities of Jesus followers. Wow, that's fascinating. Fascinating. Thank you for doing that good work. And I, I'm confident we'll see that in various forms through publications that you bring to us in the, in the years so. ahead. Yeah, I do too. Thank you, Darlene, very mm -hmm. much. We're glad to have you on faculty. Dr. Greenberg, welcome. It's great to see you again. I know that you have your PhD from Trinity College at the University of Bristol. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, and uh, I want to thank you for being an, a faithful adjunct and very highly regarded adjunct professor of Old Testament at Denver Seminary now for many, many years. What was your dissertation topic, Jim? Uh, the uh, topic was in the book of Leviticus. I know most people think that's the greatest book to study, but uh, and I'm just kidding, it's usually not considered that. But it was a focus on uh, the meaning of atonement in Leviticus. Mm. So I studied all the uh, the book of Leviticus and priestly text in the Old Testament to investigate uh, why the Israelites offered an animal. What did that animal represent in the process of finding uh, uh, a uh, resolution with God on an issue or to worship God? Uh, and uh, what is the ultimate um what is ultimately accomplished with atonement, which is the Hebrew mm -hmm. verb, uh, verb kippur. Yeah. Wow, and I think I, I just read, you've just recently published a book on the same topic, Atonement in Levitic Leviticus, is that correct? A New Look at Atonement in Leviticus. It's been published by Penn State University Press. Yes. Wow, congratulations on that. Thank you. I'm sure that that comes in like a 999 paperback version, is that correct? <laughs> Actually uh, not. Um, Actually not, yeah. <laughs> So those of us who have some access to academic books or know about them know that you really often have to take out a personal loan to be able to buy some of them, <laughs> <right>? correct? <laughs> but thank you for doing that work. Very important. So uh, Darlene and Jim and I have agreed just to use first names as colleagues, peers, and friends as we uh, go through our time together. So the topic we have today, I think, is one that uh, any of us who've attempted to read through the Bible as a whole or in a, in a narrative form or studied both the Old Testament and the New Testament would uh, have questions about. And, and that namely is, why is it that God seems to engage humanity, uh, reveal himself even, in ways that seem different between the Old Testament and the New Testament? And so what I'd like to do is just simply begin our conversation by asking you, um, to just in general answer that question, why do we seem to have a different picture of God in the Old Testament and the New Testament? Why does he engage differently in a general sense? And then we'll dive into more specifics. So uh, Jim, I'd like to begin with you and then Darlene, I'd like for you to interact with Jim and follow up as well. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I oh, it, Just to begin, I think this is an incredibly important topic because it goes to the heart of why we should study all of scripture yeah. Uh, Old and New Testament, and I would contend that the New Testament uh, cannot be fully understood without studying the Old Testament. I would also just create a framework that uh, however we understand um, the interactions that are going on between the Testaments, that Jesus is God, and therefore when God spoke in the Old Testament, there was an agreement in the context of what we understand as the Trinity. So Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, along with Father and Son. So um, in regard to why there seems to be uh, some uh, differences in how we read and understand uh, the God of the Old Testament in relation to Jesus in the New Testament, one, one thing that is extremely important is to understand that we must read Scripture in its ancient context. Uh, and there's a lot of... Um, uh, misunderstanding in regard to then if we don't. So uh, in the ancient world, 
the na nations very much associate themselves with gods. Israel had its God. Babylon had its God. And uh, unlike us today, the people of the ancient world were extremely focused on the divine human interaction. How did God affect my life? And in fact, there was no other answer to the question other than the God, God has done a God uh, in the case of Israel, Yahweh, God has done something to affect my life. So that is, um, you know, a key thing that we have to understand. Now, when we read the ancient texts then, uh, and in their context, then a lot of our conceptions of the Old Testament God change. Uh, I'll give you one example, and then I'll hand it back off to Mark. Uh, in uh, a lot of critical uh, thought comes about in the Old Testament uh, uh, in regard to Joshua and genocide. Uh, a lot of people believe that God is evil in that he causes or requires Israel to do uh, mass genocide of the Canaanites. However, reading Joshua in its ancient context uh, and understanding words uh, in the Hebrew language, for example, in Joshua, the word city, um, in uh, we read city and we think of New York or Los Angeles or, or Denver here, uh, but that is not what Joshua is referring to in his book. Uh, the word city, it would be better understood as a military fort. Hmm. So Israel did not attack uh, the common people. Uh, there was, and, and there was not a military engagement with the common people. There was a military engagement with the religious uh, infrastructure of the Canaanite uh, people, mm -hmm. uh, their their uh, their temples and so forth. So understanding that changes the picture quite a bit in terms of what happened in Joshua. Hmm. Yeah, very much so. Darlene, could you pick up on this whole question of the um, religious context, the worldview context of the New Testament, and how as Jesus reveals himself to to, to both Jews and then through with the apostles, as, as well as Jesus, to Gentiles. What was that religious context? How did folks understand the spirit world and particularly ethnic identity as a part of that? Yeah, so um, it is really important, just as it is with the Old Testament, maybe slightly less foreign when we're talking about the Greco-Roman or Mediterranean world uh, than the ancient Near East. Uh, but all of life, would have been intertwined with what we call religion. Uh, so in the Western worldview, we tend to separate these things out into compartments. We think of religion as a thing that's practiced and it's kind of over here. Um, for them, it, it would have been wrapped up in every sort of aspect of life. So even when we talk about, um, for example, Second Temple Judaism, uh, by which I mean Judaism during the time of the Second Temple, so when it was rebuilt, uh, post-exile all the way to when it was destroyed in 70 AD. Um, we think of uh, Judaism as a religion, and that's going to lead us astray um, because what was really wrapped up in Second Temple Judaism and really all the other whatever religions were going on um, would be a combination of language, culture, ethnicity, uh, rituals, practices, worldview, mm -hmm. and all of these things wrapped up into one. So if we're not understanding that sort of context, we're not going to understand um, the book of Acts, where Paul is having to go into Athens, and not he's not only challenging their religion, he's challenging their entire worldview, he's challenging um, their social relationships, this would throw their economic standing uh, into issue, this is why in Acts 19 with Ephesus, uh, it's such a big deal, and they're, they're there's mob violence about rid as Artemis of the Ephesians because religion is economic, is social, uh, is kinship and all of these other things. So that's a really important framework to keep in mind. It is, yeah. So we tend to compartmentalize religion, right? We have our religious life and certainly in American evangelicalism, we have this very siloed view of our relationship with God and tend to separate that from social identities, of course, now we're seeing the revival of national identity in relationship to faith as well. But that's another topic for another event uh, down the road. <laughs> Jim, I want to I want to go back to uh, this whole idea of ethnic identity, uh, a God being associated with a people. And then in Israel's case, obviously, 
uh, as a people, they didn't have a nation, right? They were, they, uh, the descendants of Abraham wandered, then they're in exile in Egypt. Uh, then as they move into the land, a national identity as well begins to form as a platform for then these commands to defeat those who are in the land. Part of the challenge with uh, an understanding of city that you gave earlier would be a command. Let me read one to you. I hope this doesn't feel like a gotcha moment. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20, 16 to 18. Uh, he says, um, however, in the cities of the, oh wait, um, yeah, however, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes, completely destroy them. And then he lists off the various uh, people groups or city states as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods and you will sin against the Lord your God. Uh, and then later on in 1 Samuel 15, this is where we get the a not total annihilation, right? So Samuel said to Saul, I'm the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So in the first setting, I can see how your understanding of city works. Tell me how that works in the second passage in 1 Samuel 15. Uh, Mark, if you don't mind, can I bridge it a little bit to a larger point and then Absolutely. come back to this? Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're the person they came to hear, not me. So you bridge <laughs> okay. all you want. Thank you. Um, I think one important um, uh, theme of the Bible that uh, in order to understand this question of uh, what God commands in regard to entering the land and the Amalekites is uh, what is God uh, seeking to achieve with all these uh, um, commands and actions toward Israel. And so I see a, a, a very important theme uh, throughout scripture, and that is God seeks to redeem his uh, creation. Mm -hmm. So in Genesis 1, God creates everything good. And, you know, we kind of look at the word good in Genesis 1, and we think, well, good is better than bad. You know, uh, pizza is better than uh, liver and onions. But uh, really good in Genesis 1 means uh, to bring life. God, everything God does brings life. And the problem is uh, what Genesis 3 answers is what happened to humanity? Why did humanity uh, become fallen? Why uh, did humanity become evil? Um, and the issue is humanity chose to reject God and his good purposes, his life-giving purposes, and rather choose their own. And unfortunately, when we choose our own uh, good, uh, what we think is good apart from God, it ends up being death and evil, which is exactly what happened between Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel had an uh, offering to the Lord and everybody wants to know why the offering wasn't accepted. But the real issue is why didn't Cain listen to God? Because he had rejected God and his good purposes. Uh, and so uh, if, the redemptive theme is, is, is one of the most important themes in scripture, then what is God doing in order to redeem the world? And, uh, you know, you go through uh, the flood and everybody says, well, that's a, a mean God because he destroyed everybody but Noah. But the problem with the flood is uh, in the world at that time is that humanity was so evil as if God did not destroy it, humanity would have destroyed itself. Mm -hmm. So God mercifully sent the flood and saved Noah to continue his redemptive plans for creation. And then that continued through Abraham and the patriarchs and then into Israel, which is uh, one of your uh, scriptures you read about Israel's job uh, in order to become a nation. So 
Why did God command, before I get into the details of the Joshua and the Canaanite uh, war, and then also the Amalekites, is why did God even command Israel to go into the land? Well, uh, in order to redeem the world, God was working through Israel to teach Israel how to be uh, recover his image, to recover his goodness. And so he did that in three uh, key ways. One is to give him, give Israel the temple, which is God's presence in the land. This is not atypical to most ancient uh, countries. They would have a temple for their God. We had one, uh, Israel has one temple, one God in one place in Jerusalem. That temple was to teach Israel how to be holy like God and how to approach him and worship and find grace. Uh, God gave Israel Torah. Torah is uh, God's very character and attributes represented in law. It may be foreign to us because we don't understand the ancient practice, but it is God's good, uh, good purposes expressed in his law. And then uh, the other key element was land. Israel needed land. Why did Israel need, need land? Leviticus 18 is if you don't clear the land of the religious uh, uh, influences, uh, you will not learn how to be good like me. You will not come back to me. You will not understand me. So you need a land where you essentially have a holy space where you exist uh, without the influences of your neighbors who are, are fallen and corrupt. So uh, that continues all the way through to Jesus Christ. But in the context then of Deuteronomy 20, Israel needed to enter the land, clear the land of its military and religious infrastructure in order to not be corrupted uh, by those things. Uh, the common people were uh, left alone, uh, uh, as we see in Judges. They are all over the Judges mm -hmm. book. Uh, in regard to the Amalekites, it's a little bit of a different issue. The Amalekites attacked Israel while they were traveling to the Promised Land, and they... Uh, um, sought to destroy Israel, which was uh, going to uh, clearly affect God's redemptive plan. And so uh, the Amalekites represent uh, what I like to say in a pastoral way, uh, they got in God's way. They got in God's redemptive way. And I want to assure everybody who's listening uh, throughout the Bible consistently, you don't want to get in God's way. When you get in God's way, he will clear you away. So... Yeah, Jim, thanks for framing that, that question, right? So we dive into these passages and without that biblical theological framing, as well as the cultural framing you've given us, it does seem as if God's being uh, vindictive in the way that he responds, framing all that we read in scripture around God's redemptive mission in the world or God's desire to make himself known so that all people can worship him, I think is a very powerful tool for navigating some of these, not just a tool, a truth for navigating these difficult passages. So thank you very much for that. Darlene, if we could, I want to transition and talk a bit about the fact that God redeems and uh, makes himself known as a redemptive God through his people and ask, what are the points of continuity with the people of God that we see form in the New Testament known as the church? And the people of God, as Jim has helped us see in the Old Testament, what are the points of continuity, not the points of discontinuity when we see God working through his people? Yeah, so I think, uh, as Jim said, God works uh, in consistent ways across all of scripture. Um, and I think uh, we don't see that partly because, as we've talked about, we, we don't have the context that we need to understand. Uh, but also because we tend to uh, kind of misrepresent both the Old and the New Testament. Um, we kind of uh, oversimplify both. And then it, it sounds like they're different things they're, or God is functioning in, in different ways. Um, and so one thing I think that's really helpful and one thing that I, I complexify for my New Testament students on the front end, I find that we always need to start with complexifying before we can uh, clarify, um, is, is their assumptions about Torah or law. Um, and the assumption that they usually come in in New Testament survey classes, uh, that law and grace are somehow at odds. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I need to start with helping reframe the Torah 
as God's grace of revealing himself mm-hmm. um, for how people are to live into, into relationship with him and his presence. And that through the sacrificial system, they, they would not in their context have seen this as burden or any of this. You read Psalm 119 and it's all of these verses um, over and over and over of how good your law is. We delight in your law. I love your statutes over and over and over. And so we're, we're coming to it in a, in a Western mindset of, oh, this is really burdensome. They would have found all of these things uh, to be really um, heavy. Uh, and that would have been foreign. They would have seen it as, oh, God is revealing himself to us and showing us what his expectations are for us to be in covenant relationship with him. That's Mm -hmm. a gift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we need to start with that because then Jesus coming on the scene saying, this is how you relate to God makes so much more sense. And Jesus is very much in continuity uh, with, let me show you what it means to be in relationship with God. And let's talk about the covenant and the Torah and center it now on the person of Christ and say, okay, he's not, he's not throwing out Torah. And that's another thing I, I have to kind of help my students wrestle with. Uh, what he is doing is internalizing Torah. That's what we see in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, he's internalizing it. So we get Jesus saying, you've heard that it was said, don't murder. And yet I'm going to pull you deeper to the heart issue of where that starts. Like the symptoms are up here. Let's go to the heart issue. And this is in keeping with, with God saying in Jeremiah 31, I'm going to write your law on your hearts and minds. It's going to be internalized now in this new covenant. And so all of that to say, I see the people of God having a lot of continuity in the sense that they're the ones who dwell in relationship with a God who reveals himself. And that carries out to all of life. Uh, which I think is the big picture uh, kind of role of Torah is uh, basically what I tell to my students is God is in the details, Mm -hmm. right? There is nothing uh, that's outside the scope of the covenant relationship with Yahweh. And that, if you frame it that way, uh, is quite a gift. Um, And so I see the continuity, but I I would not say that Israel is the, the replacing, I mean, the church is replacing Israel, it's just kind of a different conversation, mm-hmm. uh, but I would I would see ethnic Israel as still having a, an important role in salvation history. So not replacement, but this idea of of being in a covenant relationship with God. Good, thank you for bringing that up because one of the other differences is the Old Testament. When in some uh, verbiage, is like the the God of law, and in the New Testament we have the God of grace. Right, so framing the idea of law around a grace. And how God uses law, not only for the benefit of life, uh, the the fullness of life for his people, but as a testimony to his character for the nations around him, I think is a beautiful uh, image or a beautiful way to understand. I'd like to ask you, Jim, as well, um, we tend to think of the Old Testament and we tend to think of Israel as almost a mono-ethnic people. And in fact, sometimes there are even more racial definitions of Israel. I'd like for you to talk a bit about if God's desire is to redeem all people and all nations, even in the Old Testament, um, how is it then should we understand Israel and its relationship to uh, different uh, folks who aren't born to uh, as children of Abraham, to parents who were uh, part of the Jewish nation? What, what is the ethnic makeup of Israel and how does that then relate to uh, how God relates to his people? Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I, it's, um, we think of Israel as sort of this holy bubble where you only had uh, Israelites living there. But the truth of the matter is Israel was a, a nation that interacted with its ancient neighbors and they had, uh, there's whole sets of scripture and uh, regulations on how the foreigner should live in the land. The foreigner was to be part of the land. The temple has a, uh, a court by which, uh, um, you know, n- uh, non-Israelite could come to the temple and worship uh, Israel's God, Yahweh. Um, you know, Exodus 19 states that Israel is to be uh, um, 
a kingdom of priests, which means to reflect uh, God's um, uh, Torah and his goodness that they learn through Torah to the world and to invite the world uh, to understand that. Um, there is an interesting dynamic, though, in that Israel lived with its neighbors, and Israel was the center of all turmoil in the uh, in that geographic area, because uh, uh, Israel was placed um, between the major powers of the time: Egypt, uh, the Hittites, the Assyrians, and the Babylonians. So, uh, in some ways, the nations had no choice but to interact with Israel because they were the center of the trade routes, and also. Uh, in between the other major powers where they became threatened by. I, I don't think that's an accident why Israel was there in that setting. But in that setting, Israel was to express God's uh, goodness to the world. And honestly, uh, Israel uh, faltered. And uh, as a small nation, God protected them. But um, as they did not represent well, God uh, Yahweh to the nations, uh, God allowed the nations to then right. attack Israel and uh, in a disciplined way, but then ultimately in a way of judgment. So that's another interesting point, right? Uh, several interesting things here. I, I, I remember uh, the quote from Golda Meir that the God of Israel led them to the only land in the Middle East without oil. So <laughs> that's probably not what we have in, per, in view in the Old Testament. It is, I think, true, though, if God were to, if God's desire was to create for himself a people and just protect those people, he certainly wouldn't have chosen the land of Israel. Right. Because, as you said, that's where all of the nations came together. And if we see God's people as a, as a testimony to the nations, what a perfect place to set up a testimony to the nations. Um, correct? Yes. Let's talk about, let's talk about God judging his own people. The, the judgments that God pronounces against Israel uh, through the prophets and the warnings he gives them throughout even uh, throughout the Pentateuch. Uh, how do we relate to that as uh, somehow consistent with what we see in the New Testament, where it seems as if God relates, Jesus relates to his people, that Paul relates to his people, to God's people in a different way? Jim, how do you how do you interact with that? Well, I'll, I'll just start and then bridge to uh, Darlene. But the the judgment aspect of God in the uh, Old Testament is again very consistent with His redemptive purposes. So, if Israel is to represent uh, Yahweh to the world and to learn God, uh, God's good through Temple Torah and land to express that to the world, then they must. Uh, be in covenant with God, and they must obey him. They must follow him. Uh, and what happened, uh, it began, of course, with the north first splitting from the south. The north became more and more corrupt with, uh, and the premier issue uh, for judgment is idol worship, uh, mm -hmm. worshiping other gods. And in that process, as you worship other gods, of course, you follow those other gods, and then you disobey uh, uh, Yahweh God's good, Israel's God's good purposes, uh, because the other nations, while they had some ethical guidelines they lived in and they worshiped their gods, they did not have this covenantal idea with their God, and they did not have this idea of bringing life to the world and uh, uh, bringing good to the world. So uh, as Israel and then finally the South uh, disobeyed the Lord, he had no choice but to judge them, again, like the flood, to save the world, he always saves a faithful remnant. And uh, this is often overlooked in the prophetic books, is that those who are saved are the faithful remnant. Those who are judged are the ones who are uh, disobeying the Lord. The faithful remnant then carries on God's good redemptive purposes. Uh, and um, clearly, uh, Jesus, uh, as a... Uh, human Israelite, I know he's God as well, but as he comes from that faithful remnant. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and God uh, sustains that faithful remnant and brings it back to the land for the purposes of his fulfillment through Jesus Christ. So Thank I'll you. bring that to Darlene then. Yeah. Darlene, how do you see those themes of judgment in the New Testament and justice? Yeah, I, I also see continuity on that theme uh, throughout scripture. 
we often kind of uh, misrepresent uh, both testaments, I think, as all judgment in the former and all grace in the latter, but that's a misrepresentation of both. Uh, there's also judgment in the New Testament, and it makes um, a lot of people in our churches uncomfortable. It's um, uncomfortable to modern sensibilities in our culture, but it's there. I mean, you have Ananias and Sapphira in mm -hmm. Acts 5, and they lie about the money they got from their land. And Peter's like, you can't lie to the Holy Spirit, and they're dead. You know, like, there is something very serious about um, trying to deceive, and especially in that context with the immediately preceding passage of Acts 4, talking about how the new kind of nascent Jesus movement um, is very unified. They're sharing everything that they have. They're engaged in prayer. And, and Luke juxtaposes that with Ananias and Sapphira. They are a threat. Uh, and so they've, they've become a threat to the cohesiveness and the purity of the people of God there. And you, that's, that's where God steps in and, and there's severe consequences for that. Now, I, I'm probably not alone that I have never heard that passage preached, right? That's right. But that's an instance where, uh, you know, and Jesus, Jesus is preaching judgment as well. He's warning them because he wants them to repent, but he's telling them that the destruction of the temple is coming uh, in AD 70. And we, he shows up in the book of Revelation as a judge in his second coming. And we kind of avoid these passages, I think, in our churches to our detriment mm -hmm. uh, because we, we can misrepresent the seriousness that God still takes in um, in the New Testament as well. It's interesting, isn't it, that if God's people worship other gods or live in ways that are contradictory to God's character, then the nations have nowhere to find the one true God. Right. They are the ones who are revealed. We are the ones who are revealing the one true God to the world. And so if we abandon our relationship with God or we misrepresent him in our behaviors, then in many regards, we are denying the world. We're denying the nations the testimony that God desires them uh, to have. I'm going to invite Chris to uh, come on and share some questions that have been submitted by our participants. Great, thank you. We've had a lot of good questions and a lot of hard questions. I want to add to our participants, we are recording this and it will be emailed out within a few days after. And you also could find all of our in perspectives if you go to our website and go denverseminary.edu and click on resources, you'll find all of our in perspective recordings there. So you will get this. Um, I have multiple questions. The first I'm going to ask is probably for all of you. We, we are told do not murder, but we see that there are exceptions where this is right for God to destroy people people groups that are getting in the way of his kingdom. What would you say to a group of believers who feel called to destroy a certain group of people today for the advancement of God's kingdom? Anyone want to take that one? <laughs> all right, let's fight over who speaks first. <laughs> I can't, I, first of all, I can't imagine that that would happen or does happen, but I'm going to assume that there's some reason to think that um, that would be a, an understanding of what God requires of us based on the Old Testament. Uh, it seems contradictory to the, uh, to the uh, commission that we are given as God's people to make Jesus known uh, to them. And it seems to me that in, in almost every regard, a human's ability to, ter to determine what uh, that type of that course of action will always be perverted and less than what God's wisdom and omniscience would um, would ground that type of action against another. Um, maybe that's some seed thoughts for Jim, you and Darlene to um, go further in that question. Well, I would just say from an Old Testament perspective, uh, murder is prohibited. There, uh, murder in the sense of of um, uh, premeditation and desire to hurt uh, is completely uh, prohibited. And God is, doesn't like any deaths. Uh, in Genesis 9, 6, he clearly claims that he is a God of life, and he shows that all through scripture. Um, there is, uh, of course, in Israel's context, as we saw in, as I mentioned briefly in Joshua, uh, 
this idea of military conquests and, and war, uh, that is at the direct um, uh, message of God, it isn't indirect at all. I mean, there was no question that they were to enter the land and there was a purpose to enter in the land in regard to uh, uh, learning about God's good purposes. Um, and then just, just to bridge that, uh, I'll give it to Darlene in the New Testament, but there's a you know quite a different setting between Israel as a nation and what God is working his redemptive plans through versus the church and how God is working his redemptive plans through the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I also would say that um, the situation we're talking about in the book of Joshua is not in the category of murder. That, that would be seen as a fundamentally different thing. Um, but also, I think it's important to, again, recognize that, as you said, Jim, uh, that uh, the clearing of the land was a specific stage in the big picture of history of redemption. That's not the stage we're in. Uh, and at the same time, I think we need to acknowledge that the text of Joshua and other places in the Old Testament have been used in the modern era with this idea of manifest destiny and colonization. Mm -hmm. And the fundamental misunderstanding there is thinking that we are Israel mm -hmm. um, or that we are, are taking the place of Israel or that we have the prerogatives of Israel in that point of the redemptive story. Mm -hmm. And that's a funda fundamental misunderstanding mm -hmm. um, of, of that way that the story plays out, the, the intentionality of God, that there has been a progression of sorts in the big picture story of God. And that that particular stage we are no longer in, uh, mm -hmm. and so I, I need. I think it's important though that we acknowledge that it has been really abused because of that fundamental mm -hmm. misunderstanding that somehow we can pick that up and and modern empires can use that to justify colonization or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that that is just one fruit of a total misunderstanding of mm -hmm. the big story of Scripture and the role of Israel. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, because there is the tendency, perhaps, to think of our nation as God's chosen nation, right? You hear that language yeah. in some of even the political discourse that we have today, yet it's absolutely critical for us to uh, underscore that the nature of God's people in the New Testament, the church, is multinational. It's never wrapped up in, in a nation, and, and to make that mistake, I think, leads to what you said earlier. I do want to follow up, Chris, with one thing. Jim, the whole question of murder, there are some people who would say that the death penalty is okay because it's in the Old Testament, and there are people who would say the death penalty is not okay because of the teachings of Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. So we might as well go ahead and dive into a, a good ethical even political dilemma here, because the Old New Testament distinction is often used to argue for the death penalty and against the death penalty. So how do you, how do the two of you, Darlene and Jim, bring those, bring that together? The clear commands, you know, to take a life. And then how are, what are there, like seven different commands that require the penalty of death or something in the old, in Torah? Uh, and then you have the um, perhaps different approach to that in the Sermon on the Mount. How would you guys see that? Well, no easy questions here, huh? <laughs> so um, <laughs> in regard to, um, again, killing, murder is prohibited, but uh, killing is, as, Doc, as Mark mentioned, is uh, um, stipulated for certain... Um, uh, types of sins. So uh, the sins that they are stipulated for in the Old Testament are, are always community destroying, uh, worship destroying sins. In other words, if these sins aren't dealt with uh, in a dramatic way as expressed in the ancient world and their ancient way of, of, of operating, uh, the community and the worship of Yahweh will be significantly impacted. Um, the, the only thing I would say again is my understanding, I'll bridge it to Darlene, is that you know, in, in the church age, uh, no, um, we don't see uh, uh, community-based um, 
destruction as a, obviously as a, a command to then put that person to death. But we, the church does have, and I'll, again, I'll leave it to Darlene, uh, ways to resolve that. So, mm -hmm. Darlene. Well, this is an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> one thing I would say uh, in just picking up on what's been said already is that you are working with a really fundamental different context, uh, fundamentally different context in the New Testament. So that these um, kind of things that um, capital punishment would be used for when people intentionally violate the Torah and the covenant uh, in the Old Testament were not they're not on the table in the context of the New Testament. Um, I, I would put myself in the category of being against the death penalty, not directly because of a text like the Sermon on the Mount, because I'm not sure um, that really relates to a govern, government um, sort of context, uh, because it is a text that's written to the church community. And I think God is presupposing we're not going to kill each other. Um, but I, I do think it's important to think uh, and to get our some of our theology from narratives, which as Westerners, we tend not to be very good at because we like to think of truth as propositional. Um, but if you think of the story of Saul turned Paul, um, what would have happened if uh, the government had decided to execute him uh, when God actually could turn that around? And I think of, you know, people um, incarcerated and people who seem to be irredeemable to us, but what can the spirit of God do? We know there's uh, there are thriving prison ministries where people convert and they're mm -hmm. still stuck inside, but they're now followers of Jesus. And I would love for as many people as possible to have that chance. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think a big picture New Testament perspective, um, as long as people are still alive, God can do a miraculous uh, redemptive work Mm -hmm. and uh, contra our expectations. It was against everyone's expectations uh, when he called Saul on the Damascus Road too. And the church had some trust issues for a bit, understandably. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't want to cast anybody into that category as long as there's still a possibility. For redemption, yeah. Well, I know you guys didn't expect that one, so I apologize. You handled <laughs> it beautifully. Chris, come back and save us from this conversation <laughs> if you <laughs> I, I'm there's so many questions. I'm just going to pick a, 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 a good practical one that we could help our um, attendees today. It says unbelievers use the violence in the Old Testament mm -hmm. as a stumbling block to their acceptance of Christ. Darlene, Jim, and Mark, what is a relatively short answer that we could give them? Mm -hmm. Was well, that qualifier relatively short? Though? Yeah. <laughs> it becomes the difficult part of the equation. I know it's necessary, but it's really tough. Uh, to do that. Uh, Jim, what Jim has pointed out, I think, is so, so important, and that is that God's redemptive purpose, redemptive vision is for all peoples to, to come to faith, to know him, and that he does that through his people. So when his people are threatened, then God preserves the testimony of his grace, the testimony of his redemptive purpose by protecting his people. And so God's desire is for that person that you're inter interacting with to come to faith, to know him. And in the Old Testament setting, it was necessary for God to protect that testimony so that all peoples could find the fullness of life in him. I think I would start there. I, I'm confident that that wouldn't satisfy uh, the objection, but maybe a place to have a, a start of a conversation. Darlene, Jim, uh, other thoughts? I just like to add to what Mark said. So uh, the way I usually present this question is uh, the Bible is filled with tension and no one likes yes. this word. Yes. Uh, we want, again, as Darlene said, propositional truths that are always one way or another. But the Bible is filled with tension. The question uh, we have to ask ourselves, uh, and I'm just adding to what Mark said, is, um, you know, it, when when we have a, when God looked upon the world and looked upon the fall of humanity, uh, he chose, and you know, we have to assume God gets it right. He chose to work within humanity uh, so that they may be redeemed. In other words, come back to him, learn his good, and know him as their Lord. Uh, and that is going to be a messy proposition if you're working within humanity. I mean, he could have just destroyed everybody as he, you know, 
Noah wouldn't even survive the flood, but thankfully he didn't because we're here. Yeah. Uh, so God is gracious in trying, in, in not trying, but in, in his process of redemption. Uh, and there's a tension here with regards to working in a fallen world and redeeming it at the same time. And in that tension, uh, there is, uh, even though God is a God of life and rejects uh, taking life, there is going to be uh, situations, as Mark outlined, where that is going to happen. Uh, it is the nature of the tension of saving a world that is fallen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think both of those perspectives are really helpful. Both kind of we have to plug it into the big picture of the redemptive story and what's necessary to make this redemptive plan go forward. Mm -hmm. um, and also understanding the fact that you're, you're bringing up, Jim, that God is working within human history, which mm -hmm. is messy. So when, you know, the Old Testament perspective uh, that God as sovereign over the nations uses a nation to judge another nation and, and bring a war, you're going to have collateral damage. That's the nature of judgment in a complicated context. And this is why uh, God repeatedly warns and warns and warns and warns and warns his own people because he would much rather have mercy uh, mm. than judge. And yet when you have a war, I mean, even he didn't even spare the prophets, right? They're God's spokespeople and they suffered alongside their own people. Mm -hmm. So it's messy when you have God working uh, in, in human history. I don't think we can really get around that. Yeah. Good. Thank you all. Another question, Chris? Sure. I'll, I'll go for this one. And then I'm going to say at the end, how about you offer some resources that people recommend a resource that people can read more about the subjects? Um, that'd be great, I think, for everybody. But uh, I think this one will more focus on Darlene, but we love all your insight. Darlene, what characteristics of Christ arise in the New Testament that seem to present opposition to Old Testament? Particularly, can you speak to the Sermon on the Mount and how it seems to contradict our understanding of the Old Testament God in that Christ promotes peace and meekness during his sermon. Hmm. Want me to repeat any of that, or is that, did that come across well? <laughs> I think I've got the gist. Okay. I, I actually see the person of Christ as uh, very much in continuity, as that has come up a few times. And mm -hmm. usually the Sermon on the Mount is, is the place people go to find discontinuity. Um, but as I said, I, I actually read a lot of continuity um, mm -hmm. in that, Jesus isn't throwing out the Torah, um, but is is in keeping with um, the way that Jeremiah spoke of the new covenant, what we might call an intensification and an internalization of the Torah on the hearts of the people. Um, and I would say that that mercy has been all the way through the Torah as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, mm -hmm. To say, OK, we should suddenly be meek, I think, is is misunderstanding um, the nature of the Torah that God wants his people to be humble in response to him, to take care of the vulnerable in their midst, to show mercy in very tangible ways. And this is very much in continuity with, with what Jesus is saying uh, in a text like the Sermon on the Mount uh, or other places where he's saying, you know what? The first command uh, is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself, quoting from Leviticus 19. right? And so. Both he and Paul are saying, well, we can sum up all of the Torah in these two things. Love God, love your neighbor well, mm -hmm. with Jesus' caveat of who is my neighbor in that important parable, uh, stretching the category of neighbor. Uh, but I would say that is in continuity. Um, I think we kind of think of and picture Jesus as this um, white guy with blue eyes and red flowing hair holding a lamb with a child in his lap. But that's an oversimplification of the person of Jesus. He knocked over some temple tables as well. He said, woe to you. Uh, he, he said harsh words knowing that people would stop following him. Uh, and yet he, he is kind of starting this uh, movement, this remnant, if you want to use that language, um, of yes, this is what it looks like to be in the kingdom of God. You want to know what kingdom people look like? Read the Beatitudes. And what is it? Those who are mourning, <laughs> right? yeah. those who are pure in heart, those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. He's always wanted his people to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Yeah. I, I might add something I think that's really, uh, certainly in my own life, I am convicted by. I 
find great comfort and hope and joy in Revelation 21 and 22 and the making of all things new. And if I'm not careful, I love that first part of chapter 21, Revelation 21, but then there's this little <laughs> section in there where those who have committed certain sins are not going to enjoy the presence of God. That section where the justice of God is made clear. I think sometimes our since our hope is that all people be redeemed, we desire that all people come to faith. Uh, we, I, I'll speak for myself, sometimes I just don't want to admit that when God's justice is executed at the end of all time, there will be those who are judged and will not enjoy the presence of the, uh, the experience of the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, that's not an Old Testament thing. That's a summation of the whole story of Scripture brought to us in Revelation 21 and 22. And uh, certainly, I am guilty of reading past that section and not thinking carefully and deeply about the judgment section, wanting to land and focus solely on the restoration parts of that passage. Mm -hmm. But the judgment is a part of the restoration. That's the whole point, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Sorry, I got off on a little tangent there. I, I'm about to give a, an invitation and ask for an offering if we don't <laughs> do something. <laughs> I do think it's important, along with that, Mark, to jump in and recognize that um, judgment is part of what it means um, to, for us to have a holy God. Yeah. We think about, you know, the, there's indications in the Old Testament text that uh, some among the Canaanites were sacrificing their children to Molech. Now, you know, if God didn't do anything, we would have a crowd saying, how could you be a good God and a just God and not do anything? Um, yeah. But when God judges within history, also have a problem with that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to recognize that we actually, all of us, have this innate desire for what we see as justice. Mm -hmm. um, we actually yeah. think uh, Hitler should be punished, Stalin should be punished. It's just that we might draw the line on some of these other lesser ones differently than God does. But we even innately recognize that that judgment is a necessary part of having a holy and a good, just God. That's right. And there is no victory over sin, no atonement, no redemption without the judgment of God on sin poured out on Christ and the cross, right? Or expressed in the death of Christ on the cross. Well, Chris, have we worn everyone out? or? We... Yeah, it's 11.59, Mark, so I think we should get some resources and wrap it up. We thank you all, and thank you, Jim and Darlene and Mark, for leading this hard conversation, but really good, so thank you. Darlene, you have some, any, any off the top of your head, any resources that we might recommend uh, around these topics, continuities between testaments mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. vision, views of God, understanding of God, revelation, mission, all these things, any ideas? That is a lot of things. One thing I would recommend that I think is really helpful uh, in looking at the big picture of scripture and how the whole thing fits together and relating to the people of God is a book by Carmen Imes, who's an Old Testament scholar now teaching at Biola. Mm -hmm. um, and it's called um, Bearing God's Name, Why Sinai Still Matters. Uh, this is a more accessible version of her dissertation, which she wrote um, especially on taking God's name in vain, the commandment, uh, and arguing that it's much bigger than what we usually think of, that actually you need to represent God well. Uh, and so she really helps see that the people of God all the way um, from the beginning of the story through the end of the New Testament are called to represent God's well, to bear mm -hmm. his name well, mm -hmm. and what it actually means to bear God's name. It's very accessible. It has discussion guide questions at the end, so it could be used as church studies uh, or whatever, and I think that would be a great place to start, helping people see we're not leaving the Old Testament behind. Yeah. Once, one more time, title and author? Uh, Carmen Imes, I-M-E-S, mm -hmm. uh, and it's called Bearing God's name, why Sinai still matters. Okay. Jim? Yeah, I I will um I'm I'm just referencing a little bit earlier uh, the violence of God in the Old Testament. Um I would argue that is overstated. And two excellent resources to help uh, understand, uh, particularly uh when people talk about the violence of God in the Old Testament, they refer to Joshua and genocide. 
So I recommend uh, two books uh, written by professors here at Denver Seminary. One is Dr. Alain Delaire, and it's the Expositor Bible Commentary on Joshua, and also yes. Dr. Richard Hess, and he wrote a Joshua commentary for the Tyndale Old Testament Commentary. Mm -hmm. And both those speak to these issues of uh, an overstatement of God's violence in Joshua and what really happened. Yeah. So two commentaries on Joshua, one with by Dr. Uh, Richard yes. Hess and one by Dr. Alain Delaire, right? That's correct. Yeah. And then I'll just do a shameless plug. <clears throat> I wrote a popular book entitled One True Story, One True God, What the Bible is All About. And it essentially lays out God's redemptive mission. The Bible is the story of God's redemptive mission for all people to know and worship him. It's available through our Daily Bread publishers or other places where you buy your books. It, it's the kind of book you can use with youth groups or anyone. It's very, very accessible. Chris, thanks for having us today. And, and certainly let me add my thanks to all of you who participated and hung in there through whatever else was going on in your life to have a great conversation. Jim and Darlene, outstanding, outstanding contributions today. Thank you so much for not only today and your good work today, but the way you support us at Denver Seminary and love and teach our students. So thank you all very much. Chris, you want to sign us out? I will do. So thank you, everybody. There's a couple of things resourced in the chat that were posted, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day, and we will do another one of these in a few months. So I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.